start. All right, I've already started. This is like we're live, man. We're live, we're so we're a minute early. So if if you're if you're watching, thank you for being on time. Free this is minute. like for yeah, this, <laughs> yeah, this, this is, is a bonus, bonus feature. A bonus <laughs> minute. A bonus minute. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. For all you guys who joined 30 seconds earlier, uh, Craig's gonna lift up his shirt for you. <laughs> <laughs> all right, I'm checking out. Oh. <laughs> I'm checking out till 10 o'clock. Oh, wow. Already? <laughs> there we go. I kid. All right. Oh, look at that. I see ourselves live over here to my left. We're, we're on the interweb, boys. Here we go. I don't believe it. See, Jonathan Howell already piped in. But bonus, he wants Craig to lift up his shirt. <laughs> That's my dude. Hey, Jonathan. Got... Jonathan, you see this? It's for you, buddy. Oh, wow. Let me see that. I didn't see that. Oh, there you go. Nice. Nice. And, okay. Um, oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, that's uh, it's the shirt from Jonathan's. Uh, yeah, that's right. He's wearing my shirt. Jonathan's podcast, Min Minute Impossible. All right. Well, I'm glad we're done plugging Jonathan's show. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So are you guys ready to, to, to run down uh, Get Carter? <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> we took a vote, right? Hang on, I gotta prepare. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me guess. Uh, get Carter. Uh, quick, uh, hot take on Get Carter. <laughs> terrible goatee, terrible suit. Next. <laughs> <laughs> Next movie. Ugh. All right, guys. Well, how excited are we to talk about Copland today? Very. I got to tell you, um, and not to get ahead of myself here, and as my dog tries to chew the microphone cable. Um, you know, watching this back again after quite a few years, oh, man, um, I got so amped for what we're about to do. How long has it been since you've seen this? God, probably a good like 10 years. Wow. You yeah, it had been quite a while. It's been a while. I haven't seen this in, in a, a little while, but it, it, it felt like the it felt familiar. Like I, I wasn't really surprised by anything when I was watching. Right. Right. Okay. Same here. I did. Any of you see in the theater on its original release? Yeah. I went and saw this in the theater. Yeah. Me too. I did as well. Yeah. Okay. Well, look at that guys. Look at that. We, we, we helped the box office and the box, <laughs> the box office was $45 million domestically, which uh, in today's dollars would have been about uh, $65 million domestic. But what it cost to make, it had to cost like, like four bucks to make. Yeah, it's not a very flashy movie. There's, I mean, there's no CGI. Very simple stunts. It's basically a play. Um, yeah, very cheap. And I know Stallone, and I know I don't know about the other actors, but it did Stallone take just SAG wages on this? I think so. And I've That's, talked yeah. about this on Slycast before. And I, you know, knowing the Weinstein's are involved in this movie, and we're sort of involved in what happened to Sly directly after this. You know, like like I said, we've talked about this on the Slycast before. There's more. There's got to be more to this story because this was really a point in in Sly's career where he had the opportunity to pivot and go back towards, you know, that more of the acting side of things and the less physical, um, you know, action star role, which was appropriate for a guy that was, you know, the age that he was, and. Man, if those wine scenes didn't sabotage him, I mean, I love where his career has gone since this. It hit some rough patches, but I'd love to be in the alternate universe where we see some of the other movies that Sly made as a quote unquote actor. Yeah, uh, and I just realized looking at my screen here, I'm not too sure why you guys aren't popping up when you're talking. I apologize for that. <laughs> it's just my ugly face up here. <laughs> You have to click on on your face again. Right? Is that so, how it happens? If I click click on Craig right now, does he pop up? Let's see. Yeah. Maybe if I do it manually, I'll try that. Okay. I'm sorry. That's terrible. I'll do it a man. I'll I'll be like a director. Oh yeah, it does work. So I'll make sure whoever's talking, I'll click on their face. Okay. Um. So yeah, Craig, to, to speak to what you're saying there, and maybe I'm going even ahead of the review in a way in a weird way, but this movie is a frustrating movie. Hot take, I know. It's a frustrating movie, not because of what it is or how good it is, but in a weird way because of how good it is. Like, he, do you think Stallone 
okay, how do I word this question? Like, this movie does remind us of his acting prowess. This movie came out 21 years after Rocky. Is that right? 97. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, and then this movie was 21 years ago today, like now. Isn't that weird? So enough time has passed between Rocky 1 and Copland and Copland and now. That's depressing. This this is where I'm depressed because just like what you're saying, we've had 21 years between Copland and 2018. Where is our other Copland besides Creed? Where is it? Well, this was supposed to be yeah. his artistic breakthrough, right? This was going to be Stallone getting out of that action, out of um, like out of the uh, the limelight that that he unfortunately um, forged for himself, right? This was going to be his rebirth, and I don't know why, but the reviews on this and Stallone's performance were were just destroyed for some reason. Why? I thought he was yeah. great in this. I think it was his his reputation, I think, was what was being reviewed as opposed to his true ability as an actor. And, you know, one thing that the Internet has sort of brought about is, you know, more, I don't want to say geek reviewers, but geek reviewers. And I got to say that I, I bet you around this time, like a Roger Ebert probably dug this movie and probably wrote a fair review but you've got a lot of a lot of reviewers that are just too cool for the room and and a lot of times it's just easier to dismiss somebody than to give them credit for a performance you know it's it's funny that you know the same year this came out um you know, boogie nights came out in 97 right and you had marky effing mark turn in a great performance you know that for whatever reason people were able to accept um and it, it, it amazes me that critics were able to look past Marky Mark from the Funky Bunch, um, but couldn't tune in with what's what what Stallone was 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 doing. So yeah, I, I read I actually read Roger Deber's review. He gave it two out of four stars. Wow, that's surprising. Terrible. Yeah, it's unfair. Okay, well we're gonna, we're to get into this, but that that's my hot take at the beginning is just watching this movie and doing the timeline in my head between Rocky One, Copland, Copland, and now Creed Two. We don't have another Copland, and that's <laughs> frustrating. So we know that Stallone has this in his tool or, or in his wheelhouse, in his tool belt, whatever metaphor you want to use. Yeah. And maybe I'm getting a little bit ahead still, and maybe this is the time to talk about it. Why doesn't he do this more? He's worth five hundred million dollars, according to NetWorth.com. Whatever. So give or take, he's worth anywhere mm -hmm. between four and five hundred million dollars. Why isn't he doing the passion projects that he talks about, the Ed Edgar Allan Poe movies or just whatever? I know he's just built a Balboa Studios. I, I don't know quite all about that. Maybe that's what he's doing now. Maybe he's finally realizing at 72 he's probably should start doing this, some of these passion projects. But 21 years, man, like doesn't he have a million or two dollars to, to – to throw down, so, you know what? I'm going to do an independent film. I'm going to fund it myself. I want to get. I want to be hungry again. Work with some hungry directors, hungry editors, and let's just do something. I, I don't know. Well, I, before I answer that, I will say that we didn't get another Copland, but we did get an Ants and a Spy Kids 3D game over. <laughs> oh. <laughs> but I guess I, I guess we're going to review those at some point. <laughs> I, I, I kind of feel like in 2005. Uh, Balboa came out in 2005, right? No, 2008 Did or 2006. Six, 2006. Yeah. Okay. So I kind of feel like uh, Sly had another opportunity to do this in 2006 and then 2008 when Rambo came out. And I, he just never seems to follow through on his opportunities. Look at, look at what he did after Creed. <laughs> and uh, and you know, we all talked about what you know how this you know the 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 Oscar nomination sort of re-energized his career and legitimized him as an actor again and all the opportunities he had in front of him and then he went and did what Escape Plan Two. Um, it was like he 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 went back to what he was known for. What he was I don't even want to say what he was best at because he killed it in Copland. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I think this the, the 
something went down with with the, with the wine scenes in Miramax because what is that my, story? What is that in, story? Unless my memory's faulty, he had a multi-film deal with them, and then after Copland performed the way it did, they kind of just you know they I I don't know if they didn't follow through on the deal with with Sly or they cut him loose or what, but they had made a commitment to him, and then I mean this movie performed the way it did. And shortly thereafter, Sly was straight to video. Mm -hmm. So I, I know there's another, there's got to be more to the story here. And, and like I said, you know, with what's come out about Harvey Weinstein, uh, you know, since this movie. Um, and also if you look at how the guy sort of, you know, did business, uh, it doesn't surprise me that he might've, you know, partially sabotaged Sly's career. I'm wondering. I'm wondering. I've heard some uh, rumors or some thoughts on that. Wine scene might have blacklisted Stallone to some degree, and but you know what? Maybe we'll save that for another uh, another discussion because I don't know enough of, to talk to that. But let's talk about the movie. So maybe people want to hear our thoughts on the actual movie itself. Copland. I guess that that was just my thought on how frustrating this is because when I watched this like 24 hours ago, 48 hours ago, it just reminded me of how much Stallone has in his tank. And I felt as a fan for 21 years later, I'm like, oh, why didn't we get a Scarpa? Why didn't we get some Mafia movies? Why didn't we get him playing mm -hmm. a bad guy? Why didn't we get him doing... Why, 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 why? I, anyway, so we'll never know, but let's review Ro uh, Rocky. <laughs> so let's, re let's review Copland. Uh, we should tell our listeners, uh, Doug, what do you do for profession and where, where do you live? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a police officer from New Jersey. <laughs> That's awesome. Did any of this ring true? Now, off the off the off the right right away. Does does any of this ring true? Any of this? No, movie? no, 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 no. Locations, yes. Um, some of the stuff I'm I'm sort of familiar with, um, but Racism? most of it. The, <laughs> Just, <laughs> Just joking. Just <laughs> joking. It's it, it's almost all fictional and would never happen. Hey, hey, right. Doug. Um, is how. How many years too old is Harvey Keitel to do what he's doing in that movie? He's like a uniformed cop in that movie, right? Yeah, yeah. He's <laughs> definitely too old to be a uniformed cop. I, figure... I mean, that's see, we're, we're jumping to the end of the movie here, but you know, or towards the you know the last third of the movie. But when he shows up at that that building uh, uh -huh. with the rooftop fight, and you see him in like the 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 standard movie cop uniform, you're like, really? Mm -hmm. It's like, isn't this guy like? about to collect a retirement check yeah he should be either detective if not a detective and he's still on patrol he should be a lieutenant or a captain at his advanced stage definitely not on the beat what what rank was he did you catch it uh you know i did not i did not um that's okay no so, i didn't I, no i didn't let's talk about I, do you want to break down scenes, or do you want to go and order the movie, or do you just want to talk about things like we just did there, like talk about certain scenes that stuck out yeah. to you? The cast well, itself is huge. Let's talk about yeah. that. I think the main yeah. thing is it, it's funny how it, it's, it kind of starts like a Scorsese movie, mm -hmm. and it ends like a Scorsese movie. And what's your take on the sort of bookended Robert De Niro um, voiceover? Because... A lot of times in movie, Narration. that's a that's that's a yeah that's a tool that's used throughout the movie, and here it's really used at the beginning, and the end. And I'm curious to see what you guys think. But last night I was trying to justify it from a writing standpoint, and I thought mm -hmm. maybe that was something from one of uh, his files, Robert De Niro's files, that you know was sort of being read to us. Uh, that's a great question, actually, Craig. Uh, and I thought about that too. I seen it again for the first time in a while i was like oh yeah de niro opens the discussion and he closes it's like a de like and maybe it's just maybe to give de niro more screen time he doesn't have a lot of screen time he's kind of like uh almost like the, uh, jack nicholson amount of time from a few good men you know like yeah, he's yeah. a big he's a big name but he's not the name in the movie uh Let's talk about De Niro then. While we're while we're talking, let's well, talk. Well, I don't want to get I don't want to get past the, the the book ended. Um, okay, sure. Narration. I don't know because... why. I don't know why then. <laughs> no, I actually think it, it's it's if you think about it, the the ending narration really really um, probably uh, cuts about twenty minutes out of what have been an extended ending of this movie, and the and the um, the opening kind of sets up Copland, if you will, and I guess as um, 
you know, I'm not sure if there's any other exposition you can do to sort of establish what he establishes in that opening voiceover, but I, it, I guess it's important to know what that town is. Um, I, w I would like to go over it really quickly and poke some holes in it, if I may. <laughs> <laughs> Please do, yeah. That's what we're here for. <laughs> Um, so what Robert De Niro's voiceover is essentially saying that back in the 70s, uh, the New York Police Department officers wanted out of the city, but only transit cops could live outside of New York because they're also run by New Jersey and Connecticut, <laughs> which is partly true. They don't call it transit cops. Um, here we have a uh, New York and New Jersey Port Authority Police Department, which um, they do the bridges and tunnels. They run uh, both New York and New Jersey, the train stations, and yes, they're um, they work both sides of the of the border, and they can live inside or outside New Jersey or New York. They're not called transit cops, and I don't think Connecticut is included in that. Um, but what they say is that that these um, New York, the York Police Department, which is just their pubs in the subway, so the city could declare them auxiliary transit cops, which I don't believe exists. And uh, even if they were in, uh, uh, declared like a part time transit uh, or Port Authority police, you can't be a part time Port Authority police officer. But if you were, um, you're still bound to within the limits of New York. If you if you work as a New York police uh, new york city police officer you are you have to live within the confines of new york city or or one of the surrounding counties oh wow well but, we just put we, well, we, we in, just put our listeners though, to sleep on that <laughs> yeah. i lost track <laughs> <laughs> you in, know in, your job doug you know your job that's good <laughs> in, in fairness in 1997 how many new york teams played sports in new jersey <laughs> Oh, yeah. yeah they, you know, yes. Everybody claims to be the New York Jets, New York Giants, but they, in fact, play in New Jersey. Yes. Yeah. Right across the river. <laughs> it's, a, right. it's a hop, skim, and a jump. Like, it truly is. Well, so, there's also no garrison, New Jersey. That is a fictional town. That's right. Correct. Yeah, that's right. Uh, the, Although, the, did, they, did they film this in, like, was it Weehawken? Or I'm, I was trying to figure out geographically where that was, Doug. It's uh, it was filmed in Fort Lee and Edgewater. Oh, okay, so which I wasn't are, too far off. This the uh the like directly under the bridge under the GWB scenes are Fort Lee. Which okay, is, that that's right where the George Washington Bridge lets on. It was the, the stuff, garment factory of uh what the garment capital of the world. Fort Lee. Yeah, <laughs> isn't there that sign when you drive through Fort Lee to go into uh, Manhattan? The only There's thing I know about Fort Lee is is uh chris christie and bridgegate <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> which that's is, the bridge, is... <laughs> that's, the bridge? <laughs> that's it's it's that that part of new jersey yes the okay. bridge it wasn't i don't think it was the george washington bridge but it was close enough uh edgewater is the um is like where like the parts of town that's right on the river that's edgewater new jersey and that's like both both of these um, shots in New York City are of the Bronx. It's not even Manhattan. And we're led to believe that these guys work in Manhattan, right? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm okay. So let's let's start the movie off. Let's let's start, start off. off. Robert De Niro has said, hey, a bunch of cops have put together a housing cooperation outside of where they are cops. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the the mortgage is better, the rent is better, and uh, we uh, basically it's like a cop strata. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that cop strata uh, community is is uh, then policed by uh, Sheriff Heflin, and that's played by Sylvester Stallone. Also, uh, if I may, sheriffs do not patrol municipalities in New Jersey. Sheriffs uh, <laughs> sheriffs are county police officers. They uh, they run the courts and uh, and county um, agencies. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Holy <bullshit. laughs> Holy holes, holes. <laughs> well, did, did you guys notice uh, the first shot of Sylvester Stallone? They had to pan down to show his gut. You know, he's going for quarters in his hands 
And of course, the camera slowly pans down to show his huge forty <laughs> pound gut. <laughs> that was the the funniest thing about watching this movie after so long. It was like, you know, you you remember that Stallone put on weight for this movie, and when they pan down, I'm like, I don't know, that doesn't. I'd love to have that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> and today, like, and that's what I was thinking too. And like, I could, you know, I don't quite have that. I don't have that gut, but. If you put a shirt on me, why couldn't they just put a pillow? Like, here's the, what, what I don't understand is like, like Sly, like his face, like, look, I love Sly, but his face got bigger and ramble than this movie. <laughs> yeah. Did, did, is it me or did he look like Frank Stallone in this movie? Maybe it was Frank Stallone. <laughs> Dude, he looks, I was going to say he looks older in this movie than he does today in real life. He, he looks okay. a lot like Frank Stallone has looked in the past 10 years. <laughs> well yeah he's 50 so he's 51 in this movie mm -hmm. and uh well yeah so we'll get this so he's 51 in real life and i'm not too sure what age he's supposed to be in the movie because they talk about he's been a sheriff for 10 years and he wasn't able to become a new york city police officer because of his hearing mm -hmm. um yeah so I, I don't know did he try for 25 years <laughs> i don't he, he that yeah that, that the math doesn't add up he's definitely <laughs> I, in his 40s like when he gets the job, which is far. Well, cool. that's the thing I, I, I was going to mention, Doug, is you can't trust anybody's age in this movie, right? Because obviously Harvey Keitel wasn't playing his real age, you know, and they never really established how old anybody is. So, yeah, he could have been playing 10 years younger, uh, Stallone. I don't know. He, that That's a rough. <laughs> <laughs> that's a rough go. Yeah, I, I, he well, looked fifty one. He looked fifty one. Let's be honest. He looked a good forty eight, forty nine, fifty one. Like he, he's not pulling off forty one here. Mm -hmm. You know what I loved about this opening scene is you get right to it with Stallone, and you start seeing him doing, um, you know, that nonverbal acting that my uh, Slycast mm -hmm. co-host uh, Jeff Hewlett loves so much. But you also see the the cop that he can be, where he's watching um, Fig uh, Figus. And uh, the lady from The Sopranos mm -hmm. uh, yeah, having Edie their conversation. Yeah, Edie Falco um, meant no disrespect. Um, but he, he's observing them, and you see the bag exchange. And you can tell that, uh, that Freddie's sort of processing it as a cop, even though he knows ultimately there's really nothing he can do with what's going on in front of him. Yeah, it's just establishing that though he seems to be a little bit out of shape, a little bit dopey, he's got that bad hearing, and as a first-time viewer, you don't know why. He, he goes, huh, what? What did you say? We're not too sure. Is he, like, dumb? <laughs> but we just realized that he's not. Okay, maybe this is too early, but I found the first hour of this movie was Rocky 1. <laughs> <laughs> it was the first hour of Rocky One. I mean, like, think of Rocky One for a second here. He goes around trying to help people out. Nobody wants his help. Nobody takes him seriously. Wow. Crosses up his nose. He's got a broken nose. He's he, like, <laughs> like everything about this first. Like, I feel like this is like, like if Rocky never became a boxer, he would have become Sheriff Heflin. <laughs> It was like it was a million to one shot to become a New York City police officer. <laughs> yeah. Oh, anyways, I I couldn't believe the Rocky similarities. Mm -hmm. Having having covered Rocky for so long and watching this movie again after covering Rocky for so long in my other podcasts, I was like, my goodness, he's it's fine, but he's channeling that acting. I guess so. It just remind me of that subtle acting that he brought to Rocky One. Yeah, let me let me expose my poor research. Uh, that I do for these episodes. Yeah, we've noticed. Um, <laughs> this was written and directed by Dr James Mangold. Yes. Who uh, a lot of people probably know from his work and, you know, like Logan. Um, he made the Wolverine movie. He's kind of like uh, kind of a big budget guy now, but this was sort of his early, what, maybe his first film. I don't even know. There Again, there's the more research. But, but I almost yeah. wonder if he wrote this with Stallone in mind. I don't think so because I think Stallone wanted the Robert De Niro part at first. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. you oh. are. Uh, it was. Hang on. Uh, Ray Liotta wanted the role of uh, Freddie Heflin, and Sylvester wanted the role of Gary Figgis. 
Oh, of oh. Ray Liotta's character. That's what it was. Yes. Okay. So can you imagine if Stallone <laughs> played Ray Figgis? I can't imagine anybody but Ray Liotta playing Ray Figgis. Oh my God, he plays that part so perfectly. It's 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 weird. It took me a long time to get on board with Ray Liotta, and it I never liked the guy for some reason. And I mean, even though I loved Goodfellas, and you know, uh, but there was always something about him. I don't know if it's his eyes um, or what, but it wasn't until I saw the movie Narc that I really sort of understood and accepted Ray Liotta. So watching Copland back with a with a an appreciation of what Ray Liotta or who Ray Liotta is, uh, he almost he damn near steals this movie. He almost you know, he James Woods this movie. <laughs> I was just going to say <laughs> <laughs> Ray Liotta's the James Woods of this film. And in fact that brings me to the next point. Stallone does a great job in this film. It reminds us again of what he has in his wheelhouse, what he has in his tank to give us an actor, give him the right role, take out all the flash and everything else. He can he can bring a good performance. Robert De Niro has done some crappy movies in his life. All these actors have, and Stallone has too. But for whatever reason, Robert De Niro and Ray Liotta have gone back to those kind of movies more frequently than Stallone has. So that being said, though, again, another one of the, the first time I saw this film in 97... The first thought I had was, is my goodness, this is a great movie, but it's great because everybody's great. And in, in a weird way, Stallone is great, but it's almost like, but so was De Niro. So was Leota. So was Robert Patrick. So is uh, Annabelle Scoria. All these actors, and uh, uh, Peter Berg, they're all good. Everyone is coming to this movie really wanting to act. So Even Janine Garofalo. Yes. <laughs> and the best friend from Tr The Truman Show. Yes. Oh, uh, no, Emmer. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Probably the most unfortunate actor in Hollywood. <laughs> he just—he always shows up. He's like, "Hey, remember me? You know, I—I I work yeah, in Hollywood yeah, yeah. too." My, yeah, uh, my, my, I watched this movie with my twenty-year-old, my twenty-year-old son, and uh, he said, "Oh, isn't that the guy from Back to the Future?" <laughs> he thought it was. Biff. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I, you know what? I got to say, there really is no. You know, I mean. In the specialist, we saw lots of, you know, uh, worst of the movie performances, but it, there's not even a questionable um, performance in this movie. They're all no. good to great. Right. I mean, there's not even a bit player in this movie that you, you know, you look at sideways. No, it's uh, it's a well acted movie. So we we talked about De Niro. We're gonna get to some of his scenes later. We'll start at the beginning. We we've, we've already been introduced to like Edie Falco is a little bit of a role. She's the bomb girl. Mm -hmm. uh, Ray Liotta uh, looking absolutely uh, horrendous. <laughs> this whole movie, he just looks like. I, I think he I think he heard that Stallone was putting on forty pounds. So he's like, <laughs> <laughs> so he stayed up for forty days. <laughs> he's like, I think I think he was doing drugs the whole movie. I'm not yeah, sure. Definitely. He looked like he was on. drugs the whole movie i got, got vibes of that movie. like the last day of freedom he ha he has in uh in goodfellas that he mm -hmm. definitely tapped into that for the entire movie he so. he definitely has that <laughs> yeah imagine but, if uh stallone got ray, ray Liotta's part remember, remember in that scene when ray Liotta's character goes to uh harvey cartel Har harvey Keitel's character and says don't shut me out ray yeah <laughs> if, if that was uh that. If that was imagine if that was Stallone. Yo, yo, like, don't, yo, don't, don't show me out, Ray. Don't show me out. <laughs> what a, it is what it been like Ray Liotta, the way he talks, the way he's able to do those things. Uh, it, it's amazing. Okay, so let's go to the back to the beginning again. Uh, we see this exchange happen between uh, Edie Falco and uh, uh, Ray Liotta's character at the table. Some money, I guess money is transferred over. And we find out later that money was used to... Um, no, what, 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 it what wasn't money. It, it no, was, it was she, the actual. She, it was it was the the whatever blew up his house. That's chemicals right. or whatever. It was it was bomb making material. That's right. She's bomb girl. She's giving. That's right. She's giving she's it to Ray. Girl. Yeah, yeah. So uh, of course, Heflin notices that. And he's what pissed. pinball machine is he playing? Did yeah. either one you get that? Weapon. Yes, lethal weapon. <laughs> Part three. <laughs> lethal weapon three. Yeah, <laughs> lethal weapon three. You're right. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So Ray's playing Lethal Weapon three, and uh, he goes out to get more quarters from the parking meter. He's stumbling drunk, and Ray and Ray's like, "You okay to drive home there, uh, Freddie?" And like, oh yeah, oh yeah, I'm good, I'm good. And so again, uh, I'll ask this question to you, and you don't have to rat your guys out there, Doug. But how many drunk driving cops do you have in New Jersey? 
<laughs> <laughs> All of them. No, I know. Ryan, I thought you were going to ask us if we were uh, pinball people or video game people. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right. Well, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to ask that, but I am. Not. I am a pinball people. I'm definitely pinball people. Me, you know, me too. I think if it came down to having a games room, you know, if I had that kind of money where I could build a room with arcade games, the pinball machine. There's something really cool about the pinball machine. Uh, yeah, I love the sounds and everything about it. Absolutely, mm -hmm. we're a bunch of pinball guys. That's great. Um, so, so what Figus does here is he puts Freddy in the driver's seat of a patrol car. Yeah. Drunk. <laughs> and says, well, no, have in, a good night. In all fairness to, to Figus, Freddy did say he was okay to drive. Oh yeah. yeah. We always, we always believe that guy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you live in Las Vegas, Craig. You should know better. <laughs> well, how perceptive do you think Figus was? I uh, he, he but that's I mean you're you're the sheriff you know in a town where there are no sheriffs because they're only county officers but you're you're the head cheese in a town where like it, it's just all cops it's all cops so who, who are you going to worry about yeah you know, not know. I'm not saying it's right I'm not saying it's right but I I understand <laughs> if I could borrow uh, something for Chris Rock how many black people are in this cop land <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> What? Why does it always go back there for you? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious. I just I, I watched this movie and I noticed, and uh, this movie, uh, they, there's a deleted scene you can find on YouTube. Did you watch it? No, I didn't. Okay, there, there's a reason why there's no black people in this cop land. It's uh -oh. th yeah, there's a deleted scene that had this had this made the movie. I'm glad it didn't because it's it's it. They're all um, playing baseball. Okay, the, the cops are all playing baseball. And uh, a car drives by playing loud, as Polly would say, jungle junk music. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> so they all throw down their bats, get into their cars, and chase after this car for playing loud music. And it's rap music. They corner these guys at, in some cul-de-sac, get them out of their cars, and uh, Robert Patrick's character plants drugs into one of the black guy's pockets <laughs> oh my god <laughs> oh, why am i not surprised and, uh, and, and, Sh and sheriff heflin's there and he's like well come on guys maybe we should and they just push him by the way he's like get out of here we got this and all the cops just start harassing these black guys and that's like the end of the deleted scene yeah it's like there was actually when when this movie came out um you guys remember the age where you could get like you know bootleg vhs tapes um, we had a connection. I don't, I don't remember where it is and, and I'm glad because I can't incriminate anyone, but we had a great bootleg network where we were, a, we were getting like, um, work prints and rough cuts of movies. And, uh, I had a, for the longest time, and it, it probably didn't make the move to Vegas with me. I had a, a VHS copy of like an early, you know, pre theatrical release print of Copland that had a lot of deleted scenes in it. And I, I don't remember if it's the same as what has since been released as I believe there's a director's cut. There is. Yeah. Yeah. It must be. Uh, yeah. The, the version I watched was two hours long. Wow. Okay. So the, the one I watched was about an hour and 45 minutes. Oh, wow. And yours didn't even have the, uh, that great scene with the, the cops wish, uh, asking the black guys to join, join them for baseball. No. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> but it sounds like you might have watched the director's cut, uh, Doug. I must have, because there, there was. I can't pinpoint it right now, but there was a couple of scenes that I was thinking that I don't remember when I originally saw it. All right, so you want to go back and watch the theatrical cut? We'll wait for you. Yeah. So yeah. let's. Uh, everyone, we'll just take everybody. a two-hour. We'll <laughs> take a two-hour break. We'll just uh, stand by. Hour and forty-five minutes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, so we got a couple things in the chat here. We just got uh, Jonathan Howell. He's mad at us for saying that Ray Liotta was like James Woods. He's still mad about the James Woods uh, from a so previous mad. episode. So <laughs> it, it's a thing now. James Woods is going to work his way into every episode. <laughs> <You got it. laughs> uh, Matt B there, one of our faithful listeners, Bebo, he said uh, the De Niro was sporting the Ron Jeremy mustache. He definitely has a 70s thing going on with the hairdo and everything. And that he's so sweaty. Jonathan goes on to say he's sweaty. 
Yeah. He's like, he, he's like half a Tony Clifton. Yeah. There you go. That's, he, that's, he also points out that there's a lot of Raging Bull in uh here in, in um Copland with De Niro, Frank Vincent, and Kathy Moriarty. Same, <clears throat> same actors? Actors, yeah. That, that was both a Raging Bull and this, but there's also a lot of uh Sopranos crossover too. There oh, was yeah. Sopr there was Sopranos guy, like the uh the picture that uh, Robert De Niro shows Heflin is, hey, you know, you know, he's mixing up with mafia guys. It's like they didn't Tony have any Tello. acting parts. Yeah, they were like guys from the uh, Sopranos. And there was a background cop that was from the Sopranos too. Uh, oh, who yeah. played the um, the priest? I think in the Sopranos. It's weird. Yeah. So I guess New Jersey really did cast a lot of people from that area because that th this was filmed in Jersey. So I guess some of these actors that are from the area were like locals. Yeah. Let Let me. If I can, this is a perfect spot for this. Um, a lot, a lot of the main cast came from New Jersey and New York. Makes Sylvester, sense. Sylvester Stallone, New York. Harvey Keitel, Brooklyn. Ray Liotta, Newark, New Jersey. Robert De Niro, New York. Peter Berg, New York. Janine Garofalo, New, New Jersey. Michael Rappaport, New York City. Noah Emmerich, New York City. Kathy Moriarty, the Bronx. John Spencer, who's, uh, I think he plays uh, Leo, the detective Leo. New York City. Frank Vincent. Who's the PBA representative? Yeah. Uh, Jer Jersey City, New Jersey. Malik also Yoba. Also, Billy Bats in, in Goodfellas. Billy Bats, yep. <laughs> Malik Yoba, who's the uh, I, IA Detective Carson, uh, yes. was born in New York City. Um, Arthur Nascarella, uh, who's Frankie, uh, one of the cops. Uh, Suffolk, New York, who is also a real NYPD officer. Edie Falco is from New York City. Victor Williams. Who uh, he was one of the cops that was interviewed. He's also in the King of Queens, Bronx, New York. Yeah, and that's Tony right. Cir yeah. Tony Circo, who plays Toy Torillo in a picture from Brooklyn. So there you go. That's awesome. Yeah, that's 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 uh, they shop locally. That's the way to do it. Um, <laughs> yeah. So definitely. Michael Rappaport, that's an interesting person in real life, and uh, mm -hmm. one of the big, actually one of the big parts of this movie. Um, mm -hmm. Thoughts on him as an actor? I, I mean, he he plays the same character in every movie he plays, but I love Michael Rappaport. Yeah, when you want that type, he's the guy to go to. Um, but yeah. he's pretty much the guy from True Romance that I think we all probably saw him for the first time in that movie. Yeah, he's that also the guy from Higher Learning, the neo Nazi. He's <laughs> he plays the same part, the whiny, you know, woe is me guy that just you know came into the wrong crowd so he's actually a huge stallone fan in real life is he yeah, oh yeah yeah he did a twitter rant and i'll see if i can find it for the uh edit the audio edit of this pod of this episode uh he does a twitter rant about when stallone lost uh best supporting actor for creed uh he went on twitter i think he did a live reaction to the loss and he was just literally upset this uh, episode may have an explicit on our uh, podcast episode because, uh, yeah, it uh, he was uh, rightfully so. He was upset about Stallone's loss, and he went on quite a tirade about that. But I think he's a Stallone fan in real life. No kidding. Yeah, I mean, who's not? Well, I think uh, Michael is probably watching this show. So, hey, Michael, uh, we really appreciate your support, yeah. and we did, you did a great job <laughs> there. Yeah, and 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 getting back to the sort of writing of this movie, and and how you know how well put together it is. And, and I kind of criticized the, the book ending narration that is kind of a, a, a storytelling shortcut, if you will. But I think the story they tell with, uh, with Murray here, uh, Michael Rappaport, um, uh, Superboy. Um, I mean, you don't ex specifically get his backstory, but you hear enough to realize sort of where he's coming from. And, and uh, what his name means, and and I think it's 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 a it's a really good, you know, uh, example of that you know um, show don't tell mentality when it comes to movie making. Okay, that's good, <laughs> Doug. <laughs> <laughs> Can't expand on that. <laughs> well said. We just got some comments here that uh, Matt B said here that uh, yeah we just talked about that where he said to watch Rapport, uh respond to. Uh, or react to Sly losing the Oscar, and he, uh, oh, uh, Man Bat, that's uh, Ar Ar yeah, Armando. Armando. Armando, yeah. thank you. He said that uh, Rappaport will always be the Nazi from higher learning for him, so there you go. As I, I said, yeah. Uh, 
uh, one of the favorite scenes, I forget where it happened in the, in the movie, was when De Niro was talking about De Niro, is when he keeps saying, the way he delivered his lines, his cadence in this film was really good. And one of the, we all know the one coming up, we'll get we'll get to it later, but uh, when he tells everyone to shut up, you shut up! Oh. You I, thought shut gonna, up. I thought you were going to say when he told everybody to go to lunch. Oh, that's, yeah. Go to lunch. <laughs> Go to lunch. <laughs> I could have watched a, a, a five minute version of that scene. Him just r- ripping stuff off the walls, knocking stuff off desks, telling people to go to lunch. Oh, it's it's an A plus rant. I I love it. Go to lunch. <laughs> so that over. that is really like sort of a a perfect example of what Robert De Niro does as an actor. Like if you were putting together a demo reel of what he does, that would definitely be um, one of the scenes. Yeah, this is a, this is a De, oh. De Niro was great in this. And that's what I was saying before. It's almost frustrating how good he was. Cause he steals every scene he's in. And I think he steals more than Stallone. Now this is a Stallone movie and he is again, showing us audience. And that's the big, that's the big talking point. The reason why we're talking about this film, is that Sloan's doing something he hasn't done since almost Rocky One. He showcased a little bit of it in the Rocky film, sure. Mm-hmm. Even his quiet presence in First Blood was shown. But what movie between Rocky and Copland did he have a Copland performance? Rhinestone. <laughs> yes. Oh, God help us. Did uh did did this, Craig this, did Craig just did Craig just reveal our next review of Rocky <laughs> our next Rocky review movie? <laughs> You I shut would, up. <laughs> I would say that this is like the showcase Sylvester Stallone movie. Like th- this is his range right here. Like if if you watch Rocky, but you've never seen, you know, <laughs> the specialist over the top Judge Dredd demolition man. And you watch this, you're like, yes, that's Sylvester Stallone. But it, he was muddied by all that, that like mid 80s action stuff shit that kind of ruined him it, not not that it ruined him because i love it for what it is right but the critics man they they that they pigeonholed him and that's all he was worth to them so when he tries to go back and do something that's worth anything they're like oh wow well, here's stallone here's the big action star trying to do something artsy and they kill him for it yeah okay, well yeah. Here's, here's a okay how do I say this? So I, I'm a big fan. I'm going to mention Metallica, right? Metallica is a band uh, that everyone knows and kind of can relate to. Whether you like them or not, you know what they sound like. You know who they are. Now, if Metallica did a banjo album, you know, to showcase mm-hmm. that they can pick on a banjo just as well as they can strum on a guitar, which they probably can, their fans are going to be like, what are you doing? We want another Metallica album. And so for better or for worse, Salone, and maybe that's why... <laughs> Oh, the dog! <laughs> Don't you bark at me? And my wife barks at me already. But uh, they're banjo fans. Yeah, <laughs> but you get what I'm saying. Like, so artistry, no matter what it is, whether you're acting, music playing, painting, a novel writer, you have your you have your wheelhouse, and your fans were drawn to that wheelhouse. And you might get the odd fan and be like, oh, I, like, well, here, even when a singer does a solo album, right? The solo album, he might be expressing or she might be expressing something different than the band to get that out of their system. But they kind of go mm-hmm. back to what they know. And let's be honest, what what audience love and what they love about Stallone, and we, we all do, we all go back to it, is the action and the fun. But I guess yeah. in 21 years, he could have probably spared some sort of independent project, I wonder. Yeah. And well, the other thing is like, you know, I've believed more and more in the sort of idea that as soon as you're a success, you're sort of ruined as an artist because, you know, success is a double edged sword, right? You know, it gives you the exposure and the, the, the fame and the fortune as an actor that you or as a musician or wherever you excel in an art. But at the same time, it sort of creates a box for you. It would be like if if Pauly Shore put out a book of poetry. It could be the best book of poetry ever, but it's not going to get looked at seriously because he's Pauly fucking Shore. Right. We're, we're trying to find the joke in his poems. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. That would have mattered. That's, that's I mean, success saying. really is the worst thing that can probably happen to an artist, but it's, it's you know, it's kind of necessary to, to con- continue being an artist. It's the ultimate catch 22, I guess. Absolutely. 
Yeah, yes. well, I, I wouldn't know success if it hit me in the face with these podcasts. I, <laughs> I was just going to say we don't have to worry about it on this show. <laughs> we'll never have to worry about uh, changing our tune. Yeah, uh, um, I, I will say one thing, though, that, you know, we, we, we all sort of already expressed what a great De Niro performance this is. But the fact that there are two quality scenes between De Niro and Stallone in this movie, and at no point do you feel like Stallone is deficient. You know, no. it, it, you know, I mean, it's really good actors elevate you. Um, and, and at the same time, you know, to be able to act with Robert De Niro, um, from what I understand, Robert De Niro really respects other people's time, you know, in, even into the, you know, the, you know, where he's done off camera stuff that they normally say, oh, the stand in will say your lines, you know, just so we can get the reverse shot. Um, so, you know, I, I, I I kind of feel like those scenes with Stallone and, and De Niro really showcase the best of both of those guys and really what De Niro can bring to a scene and also what he can bring out of an actor. And then also what Stallone brought to that scene. I think those are really worthwhile scenes and, and they're, they're scenes you can watch repeatedly. But you've seen, you've seen De Niro play that guy before, but you've never seen Stallone play the guy he's playing. Yeah. So, so I agree that yeah, it, like th they are great scenes, like with him, uh, with De Niro and Stallone. Um, but you're you're kind of paying more attention to Stallone, even though he's more soft spoken and he's. Go to lunch. Go to lunch. Go to lunch. Sorry, I love that. Uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to step on your. Uh... Yeah, yeah. No, 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 uh, I, I was but it's kind of hard not to focus on Stallone in the scenes, like you said. It's, it's, it's kind of a cool counterbalance because he's so quiet and reserved. He's but great. at the same time, that that you know that movie kind of put a spotlight on him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got some comments here in the group. We can bounce off here. Uh, Matt said that Stallone gained the weight for Copland. He wondered if he asked De Niro how De Niro gained weight for Raging Bull, and maybe the topic that was a topic they talked about between takes. Quite possibly, uh, Stallone's always been pretty good about his his body mass and uh, changing things and gaining and losing weight. I, I suspect he probably had fun gaining it, but I, from what I've read in some interviews, he was pretty he was pretty um, depressed. Yeah, he didn't like it, and he was pretty anxious to burn it off. In fact, he burned it off before they even did any reshoots. Wasn't there a problem with that or something to do with the reshoots? There, yeah. There, there's definitely a scene at the end of the movie where I saw him walking, and he was in sort of a, a, a you know, a, a, a shot from his probably his waist up, and I said he looks a lot trimmer here. And you know, I didn't even think about reshoots, Doug. But there are definitely a couple scenes here where he doesn't look like he's carrying that extra weight. Yeah, yeah and I, I, th I think there Weinstein was, was upset about it. Who was? I think Weinstein was upset about the reshoot. I think it. Oh, uh, I don't. Har is that Harvey. a joke? No, I no. I'm serious. Weinstein I'm not joke? making a joke. I know the guy. I know the guy. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you can't wonder... see Weinstein and not have like a punchline. I, I don't know. I, we'll think of something. We'll think of something. We haven't talked about Anna, we haven't talked about Annabelle Scoria yet. So <laughs> the one female yeah, you probably touched really... on the film. <laughs> we haven't talked about the movie really. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, that's why we actually. So for the people that are listening to the show, bless your hearts. Uh, we uh, we're just doing this as we go. What it, we, I kind of like the idea. We're just talking about the film. Like if we just got out of watching the film, what would we? How would we talk about it if we sat around with a couple of beers in our hand? And how, that's kind of mm -hmm. how I see this. But uh, we can we can break down certain scenes if you want, or go in order. I don't want to bore our listeners. I think the uh, coffee talk roundtable is a good way of going too. Yeah, I mean, like the well, the plot of the movie is that there's a bunch of uh, NYPD cops that live in New Jersey, and and these <laughs> you shut up <laughs> <laughs> so so this village in new jersey this town in new jersey that that houses all these cops is run by sheriff freddie heflin um but the, the they're all crooked cops what what we come to find out is that uh uh the the mob backed um the mortgages on all these these guys houses and yeah. In turn, this precinct in the New York PD is funneling drugs um, through the precinct into the city for the mob. 
so it's like a whole crooked cop scene. Um, this one cop, Murray Babich, uh, he ends up shooting two guys on on the George Washington Bridge. Yeah, that. Let's talk about that. Great sometimes. sequence. That's brutal. <laughs> okay, two things. The guy. Okay, I I probably would have filmed a little bit better. I know, I know the guy pulls out. Okay, well, actually, I got a question for you, uh, Doug. You're a police officer, right? <laughs> I am. So, if you're driving home in your civilian clothes and you're sober, so let's just say you're sober, and you saw it doesn't matter the skin color. I'm not. I'm not trying to be funny here. So, if you saw two guys clip your car, they did clip oh, your car. Well, they didn't clip it. They right. damn. They side side swap swipe. What it. would you? They what would you have done? Them. At that point, Doug, what, what what are you allowed to do as an off-duty police officer? And what are you allowed to do? Do you just call it in, just call your buddy and say, hey, I got this license plate on this guy, hit my car, and let you guys take care of it? Is that what you do? Or the, <laughs> Murray, Murray Babich, a.k.a. Michael Rappaport, did nothing wrong in this scene except being, being drunk. drunk. Right. Being drunk. That that was the only thing. The like all, all, all the other pieces fit. Like he he got sideswiped. He tried to get the car to stop. Right. He showed his badge. He identified himself as a police officer. The guy refused, pointed something out of the window. Yeah. Going at high speed, you can argue you thought that that was a firearm. He hears his tire blow out. Yeah. Which he thinks is a shot fired. Yeah. So yes. Fair. Up to that point, he is completely justified. Okay. Now, remind me of the scene, though. The car comes to a stop. He's still going forward. He hits their car. He hits away. Oh, sorry, he, he shoots before he hits the car. By the way, what a what a marksman! Yeah, no, that's uh, he shoots. He's he's leaning out the driver's side of the window with his right arm. So yeah. he's crossing his body, gun out the window. There's no way in hell you're hitting any any type of target. He, he hit them six so, times. How yeah. I, so <laughs> we're gonna suspend disbelief on that. Are there even six alone. shots? Yeah, he well, he no, he hit them six times. There was they were they, they had six bullet wounds, is my understanding. I, I, impossible. So my question though, Doug, is is he allowed to shoot that weapon while he's traveling and the car is stopped? Or I mean, still they're, they're fleeing. Is he allowed to yeah. shoot a car fleeing? We're told what? never to shoot from or at a moving vehicle. So that's because where he gets in trouble. Then wouldn't that be where he gets in trouble? Where he gets in trouble is being drunk and and shooting. No, let's say he was sober. Unarmed. Let's say he was sober. If well, he's sober, I, he's the vehicle. He's sober. The, he's 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 probably justified if he's sober because okay. he thought he was being shot at. That's yes. the, that's the key takeaway, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I'm not I'm I'm not I'm not trying to bust your chops. I'm actually just trying to figure this out because I'm I'm in the military and we have different rules of engagement. Of course, uh, we're mm -hmm. a peacekeeping nation, but but we still are, have the inherent right of self defense. And we have three things that we we have to follow. Uh, you probably have the prox proximity, uh, capability, and intent. Those three things have to show uh, in order to use deadly force. So, for example, if a guy is on the jetty and I'm on my ship, and he's pointing a knife at me, so he's got uh, he's got capability. He has a knife. He can he can mm -hmm. hurt me with a knife. He's got intent. He really wants to stab me with that knife, but he doesn't have proximity. You know, he's 100 feet away. So I can't pull out my rifle and shoot him. So, right. th so I think in this situation, now this is just me playing devil's advocate, and I'm not trying to start a cop thing here. But the car was moving away from the officer, and they, it was ahead of them, and he tried to pull them over, and now it's become a car chase. But instead of chasing the vehicle, he shoots the vehicle, mm -hmm. and there's no threat of life at that point. So I, even as a viewer, it's like, oh, he's going to get in trouble. Just by shooting these guys as they as they're because they're going to be able to reconstruct the car and the impact and when they were shot and I don't know. We have like the, another variable is the um, potential that they can cause harm to other people as well. Sure, it's uh we have something called a reasonable officer standard. Like if you believe that your life or somebody else's life is in immediate danger uh, of this perpetrator, then you are allowed to use deadly force. Right. They were just showing. They were just showing the their, their uh, carjack thing because this tire tire blew out. <laughs> it will help you pull over the side. It will help fix your tire. <laughs> I didn't even think about that. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, "Hey, your tire, your, your tire. Hey, blah, 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 blah. We we have it. We have something to help you with." Oh man, nope. no good. No good deed goes unpunished. No. <laughs> but they they tried the um, these crooked cops try to cover up because he's one of them. So yeah. these crooked cops try to cover up 
and it's um, really brazen. I mean, that that kind of shows the level of corruption, right, Doug? Yeah, yeah, right, right off the bat, because um, they're doing it in front of the EMTs who who smell the bullshit. What oh, I, they smelled it right away. Oh, what I love is I <laughs> got Robert Patrick's character. Hey, look at this! I found I found an Uzi from the 19, <laughs> 1940 <laughs> under the mat. <laughs> Whoa, there it is! <laughs> I, I love it. Like here's here's the nineteen forty Uzi uh, from a, a you know some World War Two movie put under his mat. I, I don't know why he didn't just like stuff it like right under the seat. Have another cop come in and look at the car. But it's like he literally goes to the car. Pulls it out of a paper bag. Goes here, it is. Yeah. You know, it was like yeah. I know it's just a film, but you could think they could take an extra ten seconds to have another cop go there and find it. Well, that speaks to the corruption, I think, and the brazenness of it all. Yeah, yeah the, those, the EMTs those, are already they they knew what happened. They saw it like the the dried blood stuck that was wheel lock to the guy's hands. Like, there's yeah. no that's what the guy had in his hands. So you're out of his dead hands and you're going to pretend like he had this Uzi and yeah. where the, where the EMTs um, like his, his reaction is perfect. He's like, what the fuck are you doing? So <laughs> he, now, he chucks the gun off the bridge. So Superboy's pan out. This is really good. I caught this watching this again. Uh, Superboy, uh, uh, Michael Rappaport's character. He was very, uh, he didn't like this at all. He, he told him, let's do this proper. He was actually convinced, mm -hmm. like Doug was saying, like, well, I'm drunk. I know I'm drunk. I've had something to drink. And, and so he was on Doug's side of the story, meaning like, he's like, look, they, they pointed a weapon at me. And I, I, you know, I felt my life was in danger. I've got a case. So you don't, you guys don't have to get crooked on me all of a sudden. So he was even going for the angle of don't go crooked on me. And when they pulled out the gun, he realized, and he realized they've planted a weapon. This is, this is escalating. And he's like, my badge, yeah. they're going to take away my badge. They're going to, he, that's when he went and goes to the bridge. Now he doesn't jump off the bridge. Where does he go? There, it had to be coordinated with Kaitel, right? With Ray? Mm -hmm. With Ray. Yeah. Like right in the back of his car. Oh my God. He <laughs> jumped. He jumped. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Can we talk about that? Because, it's like either Harvey Keitel is a bad actor acting a, as a bad actor or a good actor acting bad because he's saying, oh, my, he jumped. I Where did he go? He befell. He just he he was here and now he's gone. Ah, it's like <laughs> I, I like Doug's better. Yours kind of sounds like Trump. <laughs> well, Doug does everything better. He's, he's handsome. He's funny. He's articulate. I mean, he's he's a, he's a, he's a peace officer. But. <laughs> That is a good point, though, Ryan. It, it's like it could be, like you said, a good actor pretending to be a bad actor or a bad. I mean, it, it's great because you can't tell where the movie ends and where the real life begins. And mm -hmm. either way, it's a brilliant choice on Kaitel's part, right? I, I hope so because it was bad acting. <laughs> because I don't understand. Like, was he trying to convince? Was he just doing it? I wonder if he was just doing it to say, here's the official byline he's jumped. Yeah, at that point, I don't think he's really he needs to convince anybody. That's just like, like if anybody's taking notes, like this is a statement is he jumped. It doesn't matter how I say it, it. That's just what it is. He jumped. And I was corrected on Annabelle's name, the actress uh, Annabelle Siora. My apologies. That was ah. Matt. That was Matt. Uh, Matt Beeble correct me on that. Can I just say for the record, every time I see her in a movie, I always say to myself, my goodness, she's gorgeous. And my goodness, I have to see more of her. Not naked, but I mean, just <laughs> just like more movies of her. And I, I always forget and when, I, when I watch Copland, I'm, I'm like, oh, yeah, I love this actress. She's so good. and She's so captivating on screen. She's easy on the eyes and she's a great actress. Anyone else feel the same way about her? Yeah, I don't. The only other thing I really remember her in is um, "Hand of Rocks a Cradle." Oh and yeah, I, I don't, I don't remember. Her, like she was kind of like the mousy wife in that. Like I, I don't remember her being like a, a sexy. Yeah, I, I don't mean sexy the way you would look at. Uh, like I don't know. I can't think of it. It's all objective. Right? I'm not trying to, try to objectify her. You gotta be careful. No, I'm, I, I'm just. I'm say, I mean, she's attractive, uh, and but but I like her, and I like I like her screen presence, and. Just yeah. just reminded me to go back and look at more of her library. Yeah, is she? And this is a movie full of unlikable people. But it, it, was her character as unlikable to you as as it was as it was to me? Because you kind of see how frustrated Freddie is 
with where his life went when he intervened and, and saved hers. Um, but at the so, same so talk time, about that. talk about the frame of the might remind the listeners of what, what the relationship is and how so he lost his hearing. The, the setup is basically that a young Stallone and I love when they try and do Stallone as a, as a teenager. We've seen yeah. it in a couple different movies and this guy was a pretty good 17 year old Stallone. I thought, <laughs> but yeah, it wasn't bad. We get a flashback scene where we see a car come off a bridge while uh, young uh, Freddy is eating lunch. He dives in. Uh, he ends up in the car, and the car underwater has sort of shifted, so it, it limits his escape route. So then uh, in an effort to get through the window they need to get through to save this him and, and this girl, he basically smashes his the side of his head and his ear against the window in a really effective scene. Cause you almost hear the moment where he loses his hearing. Um, but, but to tie back into it, um, it almost feels like she uses him a little bit or she has used him um, for the remainder, uh, um, you know, leading up to the moments in these, in this movie. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good point. Before you get to that, I want to talk about the hearing loss scene. Every time I see this film and, there's two parts in this film. The beginning where we see how he loses his hearing because he's smashing his ear against the window. I get stressed out. I don't know. I feel the, the, the visceral. It's a good combination of editing, sound effects from the movie crew, or like behind the scenes, and then the actor pounding his ear against that window. It stresses me out about the damage he's doing. Eardrum damage stresses me out. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, but well, it's no, like, it should. I mean, and anytime you you screw with somebody's ears or eyes in a movie, most people are going to be uneasy because those are two senses that we all value a lot. You know, <laughs> Doug. What about you? Are you That's, stressed out about losing your I'm hearing? Just, I'm just like like the, um, the thought of like he's ramming his the, the side of his head against the window, and I'm just picturing like the pressure of the water like rushing into his ear as he's jamming his head against yeah. the window like that like I, I, it's visceral like you said i can i can almost feel it i got to take these earbuds out for a few minutes <laughs> <laughs> and that when that we'll, we won't talk about just yet if we don't want to but the end scene of course when the when the crook uh, the crooked cops uh shoot the gun next to his good ear i get mm. like oh my good and the blood's coming out of his ear i'm just like yeah. I watch I watch like horror flicks. I watch like you know, like blood doesn't gross me out in almost in a uh what is almost like a fantasy way. This movie is so realistic in some ways. So when that ear ear is bleeding from the sound damage, I'm just and he's and there's that ringing sound mm -hmm. that you hear as a viewer. And I have my stereo out loud, yeah. it's this high pitched ringing. He sees like the dog barking, kinda. yeah, and you're like you're like, please pass this sequence because it's stressing me out, you know. Very effective. All the gunshots like really muffled. It's like you're you're hearing it through through a lot of layers of of soundproof. You know, it's yeah. not like, like you you hear a gunshot like out in the open. It's like the report is is shocking, but with Def Freddy after they blew out his good ear, it's like really like low and muffled. So Doug, do you guys do that uh, to each other's cops? No. Little little no. pranks. No. Shoot your, shoot your... <laughs> Hey, hey, it's the new guy. Let's blow off our weapon next to here. Ha, 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 ha. Oh, you know, did that kind of shenanigans? Uh, no. What's what, your what, favorite? What's your favorite cop bar hangout that you go to? Is it the Four Aces? No, it's not the Four Aces. It's not. We we don't have cop bar. See, the, the, we don't live. None of our cops live in town. No. Where no. you guys live in Copland? Where do you live? No, there, there's no Copland. Like everybody, <laughs> like we work in town, but we, everybody lives outside. Like I, I live 40 minutes from work. So which one of your friends is sleeping with your chief's wife? <laughs> Let's see. <laughs> I love that. I love all this. Can we talk about this movie for a second? <laughs> because That's, there, is that what we're here for? Finally, there's so many. <laughs> There are there are so many storylines. This is like season one of, 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 of some series in a two hour episode. There's mm -hmm. like storylines and backstories and a dead but, cop that we never see alive. And there's like this would have made a great ten part series. It, it yeah. would have, but at the same time, it, it kind of showcases, you know, the great editing of this movie. Uh, 
and either editing from a writing standpoint or actual, you know, editing after they were done filming, but you get just enough information to know what you need to know. You know, it's, it, there's no excess fat, if you will, you know, it's like, you know, that, you know, there's a, you know, somebody's cheating on somebody else, you know, it, it, like I said, the, the fact that you get just a de enough detail to fill in the blanks that you need to fill in to understand the story. And I, and I think that's, a really sort of undervalued um, tool in filmmaking nowadays. Yeah, and, and this is actually, we talk about James Mangold. He was the writer, director of this movie. Uh, kudos to him. He was quite young. I think he was probably late 20s at the very, or, uh, you know, at the very latest. So this is quite an ambitious project. I, I think it could have, I think it could have done with less, a little bit less, maybe a little bit less of the, you know, buddy sleep with buddy's wife type things. Uh, mm -hmm. That I guess that's what I'm getting at. There's so many side stories going on that I kind of, I, even I, after like seeing this the five or six times I've seen this, it took me a while to, I, the only, the one, okay, sorry. When I watched this with, with my 20 year old son, he, this is his first time seeing it. So he saw it uh, about the age that I saw it for the first time. And uh he had a harder time following it too for because he didn't know any of these actors. He hasn't really seen any any of these actors other than Stallone. He doesn't he doesn't even know De Niro. He doesn't so he's just getting kind of getting into these movies now. And so for me, as knowing who everyone is, it was kind of easier for me to 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 separate the faces. It, to him, they just look like a bunch of mustache cops. But to me, mm -hmm. but to me, I actually knew Robert Patrick from Ray Liotta, from uh, Peter Berg, from so I knew all the different the differences. But uh, so there's it's a busy movie, is what I'm saying. So a first time viewer, it's kind of a busy movie, especially if you don't know who these actors are. I don't think anything's wasted, like that. It's it's very short. It's very like like kind of off, um, like reference, but. Um, Joey Peterberg's character, Joey Randone, who's married to the girl who who Freddie saved in the river. Yeah. Um. So his character is sleeping with um Ray Donlin's wife. Ray Donlin is Harvey Keitel's character. Mm -hmm. Talk so, about a downgrade. Uh, yeah. No kidding. <laughs> Did no you kidding. see Kathy Moriarty in Raging Bull, though, man? Ooh, okay. Yeah, she, she, <clears throat> far and away. <laughs> you guys are gonna. You guys aren't gonna believe this. You've never seen Raging Bull. That's true. <laughs> it's it's okay. I know it's. Anyways, I I was hoping that I wouldn't have to say it, but you said, "Do you remember her in that movie?" I didn't want to lie. Said, oh yeah, she was fantastic. She was gorgeous, simply gorgeous. <laughs> uh, I I I didn't. I, it's on my DVR right now as we speak because I intend on watching it and actually reviewing it for my show because I think it'd be interesting to see this movie that everyone compares to Rocky. You know, like what is the better? It seems to be that it's like the Saving Private Ryan versus Thin Red Line argument. Which one's the better film? So, I already know Rocky's a better film, but I want to see what the I want to see what the arguments are because I know and I love Scorsese and I love De Niro, but it's just one of those movies that came out when I was five years old. I just haven't seen it. Anyway, sorry, go on. Yeah, um, I, I will. Since we're confessing, I'm going to confess um, that I've actually never seen Higher Learning. <laughs> <laughs> that was. I don't think it's quite the same level as Raging Bull, but we'll allow it. <laughs> Well, it's a callback to like an hour ago. <laughs> well, I, I felt since we were all being honest at this point that I would uh, confess. Well, thank, uh, what about you, Doug? What's a movie, Doug, that you're the higher learning doesn't count. That's a terrible example. What's a movie that you think everyone thinks you've seen, but you haven't seen? Uh, Rocky. I've never seen Rocky. <laughs> <laughs> that would ex that would explain your, your that would explain your poor podcast <laughs> last year covering Rocky. <laughs> uh, you know, um, Caddyshack is one that that every time I say I never seen Caddyshack, everybody's like, "What?" I don't know why. I still don't put them the same level as a raging. I, I know. I hear you. Um, anyways, what about you, Craig? What's one that you really have? The higher learning doesn't count because <laughs> I think about ten people might know what that is. Um, you know what? I don't want to sound like a an elitist snob here. Too late. Um, but uh, you know what? I've never actually seen Evil Dead Two. <laughs> what are these examples? Oh my goodness! Evil Dead Two. <laughs> you snob. Right. Yeah. Well, it's great. It's basically Evil Dead Part One done again. <laughs> right. That's what I've heard. And it's true. <laughs> All right. You're not missing much. Uh, Bruce Campbell, his hand attacks him. He has a fight so, with his hand. 
<laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Beginning and the end. Sounds like well, when I was 12 years old. Okay, so uh <laughs> I want to I want to go back to to the Joey Randone thing. So the, Yeah, of course. The, go wherever the, you want. The, the plot of him sleeping with Ray's wife isn't wasted because when Ray decides that they're going to they're going to waste Murray because they they have nothing else to do with him because right. they have to produce a body. Yeah. So the so the politicians will get off their ass. So Joey Randone doesn't agree with that. He, he's I'm not going to help you. So what happens is he's working, he's in trouble. Ray Donlin turns his back and and Joey ends up dying. Right? Yeah. So the question the question is, does he let Joey die because he's there he's not going to help them kill Murray or because he's sleeping with his wife? Like that's I, the question. Uh, yeah, it seems, it seems like Harvey Car uh, Ray Harvey Keitel's character didn't seem that concerned about him making love to his wife. I agree. I agree, Ryan. It seemed completely driven by the fact that he knew he wasn't on board. Um, you know, with taking out Murray. All I he know is that, Doug. All, all I all I know <laughs> is that uh, Harvey Keitel loves to watch people jump off bridges and buildings. That's <laughs> <laughs> wherever he fell, he, 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 fell. he, he fell. Fell. he's down there somewhere. Oh, look, God, he look fell. At the blood. Look at the blood. <laughs> See, he's dead. He's he's right there. He's dead. He's right there. Oh my God! <laughs> Go to lunch, everyone. He jumped. Go to lunch. You're mixing. You're mixing your impressions. <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> Go to lunch. <laughs> you gotta separate them. <laughs> There's one scene in this movie that I thought was really, really good, and um, one that I I don't think people talk about very often. But when Ray, Ray Liotta is talking to Heflin in the in the bar before he goes to Ray, says, "Don't shut me out, Ray." Yeah, uh, I guess he's referring to the fact that Ray Liotta helped cover up a previous like. Like Ray Liotta's character has been around since the beginning, and I guess he didn't know about the Superboy shenanigans. He was unaware of this, which I found interesting. Did they explain why he was being shut out? I think I think it had to do with the um, the Glenn Tunney thing. Glenn Tunney was was uh, Figsy's former partner, and uh, Doug like they, they 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 refer they were they refer to this guy Tunney a lot. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but that was a murder. That was a murder that Ray was talking about. Well, sort of like Ray Liotta's right. figs was talking about saying, like, I, I helped you cover up this murder of this cop, and now you're shutting me out of the Superboy shenanigans and pushing me out of the community, I think. Am I wrong about that? Uh, you're not wrong about it. I, I think, like, they, they weren't pushing him out. They just, they weren't, like, letting him inside anymore. Because of his relationship with this Tunny guy, this Tunny guy was arrested. They called him the chokehold cop. So he used a chokehold, obviously killed somebody, and he got indicted for that. And this this Glenn Tunney, this this guy that we never really see, was Gary Figgis's partner. And then Ray Donlin turned his back on Glenn Tunney, and Tunney was going to rat on Ray and like the whole like th like this whole connection with the mob. So what they did was Ray had Tunney killed while he was in jail awaiting trial. Okay. So Figgis, Gary Figgis, um, he, he kind of started distancing himself because of that. Because Tunney was his buddy. Tunney was his partner. Okay. So, so b before that, that oh, that's good. That's a good explanation. I didn't. Thank you. I don't know. See, that's what I mean. This movie requires a little bit more viewing. I, I There's so much storyline. And I'm just not as smart as Doug. See, Doug... It's his job to be observant of all the details because he has to pick up all the crime scene stuff. And so he's following this plot like it's, well, this was based on a true story. I think it was one of your. Uh, oh, it was. <laughs> I just, I really love this. I genuinely love this movie. No, that's good. That's good. Um, so there's a scene right before, though, when Ray's, uh, when Figgis is talking to Heflin, uh, Stallone's character, and he's saying, aren't you jealous? Aren't you jealous of these guys? And it was a really and and Sheriff Heflin's like, uh, I'm not jealous. I I'm happy with who I am. You can see that he's not jealous. But he's sad. He's sad that his life is where it is. He sacrificed his hearing, which affected him being a you know being a police officer, which we figure he probably would have been a good one, an honorable one. Uh, and he actually calls right. You know, he calls Stallone's character out. He goes, you know, you've lost your hearing. You lost the girl. Uh, you lost your dream job. You should be jealous. And it's an interesting, you know, like Ray Liotta's characters. 
not wrong. It, maybe in life it's okay. Not to be jealous isn't the right word, but sometimes life sucks. Sometimes it does deal you a bad hand. And it's okay to say, you know what? I've been dealt a bad hand. And maybe that can help you heal, get over it. Because I think Heflin, he has that shuffle and that and that walk that he does throughout the movie where it almost represents just like Eeyore type from, you know, Winnie the Pooh Eeyore. You know, it's, oh, woe was me. And, he, and it's not till later in the movie that he snaps out of it. That he becomes the potential, like, you know, goes the distance with Creed. <laughs> I don't like that scene because it's like complete just exposition for the audience when he's like, maybe that's why I liked it. Thinks he lays everything out. Like you saved her life. You go deaf as a result. You watch as she marries this cocksucker and you can't get a desk on a force. There you go, everybody. That's all. That's the background on, on, uh, Hey, Freddy I Hatton. just told you, I like, I need that kind of exposition, man. Like, like, <laughs> I'm not, I'm, you know, like I, I got lost in the shuffle. This is a repeat viewing movie for me. I need to watch it again because I, I, that I, I appreciated that little send off. So yeah, that's where we are. In the film. Thank you. <laughs> but, but Doug's got a point. You know, those are conversations that only happen in the movies. Yeah. Of course, like sure. Freddie sure. knows, Freddy knows what happened. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't need Gary Figgis to tell him. Don't shut me out, Doug. Don't shut me out, Ray. <laughs> but I, I mean, not to circle back to how great um, Ray Liotta is in this movie, but I think you just hit on the point of what a great character Figus is too. And the scene at towards the end when he uh, he references Freddy taking them head on, and he explains to Freddy how you need to approach guys like this. You know uh, what you've got to make right turns and you've got to what move so diagonally. Yeah, you um, don't go down Broadway to get to Broadway. <laughs> It's uh, one of the great, great sort of, you know, speeches in this movie. And uh, I think that that is another aspect of the character that makes that performance work so well, at least, is, you know, he's a guy that's very aware. He might not have always made the right, uh, you know, the, taking the right steps in his life, mm -hmm. but he knows how everything pieces together. He knows the steps you're supposed to take, even if he didn't take them himself. You can How? tell, like that guy's a good cop. Yeah, he's a good cop, but he he lost his way somewhere. Yeah, yeah, you, you, good point. Yeah, he lost his way. He got his two hundred thousand dollars for lighting his house on fire. Killed his it was girlfriend only, in the process. It was only one hundred ninety-eight thousand. I, I he rounded up. <laughs> <laughs> We can round up. Imagine if he told uh, Sheriff Heflin, he's like, you know, I've got $198,565 in my bank right now. <laughs> Maybe 198000 is two hundred in Canadian money. Maybe that's why uh, Yeah, Ryan thinks. There you go. All right. So that was the... Uh, then we have that d domestic dispute with Peter Berg's character and Annabelle uh, Scora, oh, whatever her name is. Jesus so, Doug, talk to us about domestic disputes. What would you do in this situation right now? Uh, the husband's sitting on the sitting on the step. The wife has locked the door, but then she opens the door and he busts it down. Do you go after him? Well, the problem is he's showing signs of uh, of violence, meaning like as a victim. He's bleeding from the head, right? So at this point, you're thinking he might be the victim. Then he kicks the door in. You're like, All right, maybe she bashed him in self defense, but then she goes at him with a bottle so i mean in that case you kind of got to take her in you kind of yeah. got to take her in and you have to uh you have to offer him the opportunity to apply for an emergency restraining order against his wife and this is a scene where uh heflin offers her hey do you want to come to my house and sleep on my bed i mean come yeah. to my house <laughs> well he said to put her up at a hotel i'm just joking uh, there, there's, I mean, you mentioned before about like some unnecessary uh, scenes, and I think the uh, Liz, um, Liz Randone and and Freddie stuff, like where they almost kiss and everything, like that's that that can we can do without that. We can do without her scenes. Not her completely, but like when later on when she goes to Freddie's house and. And uh, let's talk about that scene. Bruce Springsteen. Well, well, and and that's kind of what I was, you know, getting to before. With she comes out of this movie as a pretty unlikable character because it really feels like she's she u she uses Freddie when she needs him, mm -hmm. and and yeah. and in that scene where she goes to the house, she needed a boost. 
Yeah. So she used Freddie to get that boost. Was Joey even dead at that point? I don't think so, right? No. No, no he wasn't. If, no, if yeah. he had been, it would have been a terrible, terrible scene. Yeah, that's true, true. Yeah. Yeah, she, true. they did that weird, like, kiss. Uh, he kind of put his his big head against her cheek or whatever. Well, yeah, that's the thing. The way it's, it's framed, like, you can't even tell. Well, they kiss a little bit, and then she just goes, this is crazy, and then she walks out. Like, all right. <laughs> He's like, no. Did he, have, did he have the cleanest vi Springsteen vinyl known to man? There wasn't one pop no. or <laughs> in, in that in that soundtrack. And she references he's playing an album. I love how they played Springsteen, though. It's pretty good. Imagine if they filmed this in Canada, they would have put it on Nickelback. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were going to say Neil Young. Oh, God, no. <laughs> Can you imagine? The, can you imagine? Uh, they put us some Nickelback ballad during this scene because it's filmed in uh, Ontario. I wish I had the time and the talent to do a, a music replacement for those scenes <laughs> here in Copland. I just wish I had some sort of talent. We might get some watchers or listeners. I, I'm bringing you guys down. I apologize. <laughs> Are you kidding me? All right. Uh, so I've got some comments here. We'll just speak to them real quick because these guys are chiming in. Thanks, guys. Hey, for everyone listening to our show uh, right now, can you like this video on YouTube so we can just – this helps, like, get it out there. You know what I'm saying? So don't just talk to us. Make sure you like it. Um, hey, uh, wait, I just want to address Matt. That that was yeah. Craig's dog biting Craig under the table, not me. Oh, there you go. And he wants to, he wants to know, are you outside, Doug? There are, the, the, uh, listeners want to know, are you outside? Yeah, I'm on my back deck. It's a beautiful night here in New Jersey. Wow. I'm enjoying, yeah, I'm enjoying nice fall weather. Must be nice living in Copland. <laughs> <laughs> the streets are safe. You know, you don't have to worry about any black people <laughs> playing baseball. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. You have to watch this. Delete. I am not being right. This movie is racist. There is no black people in Copland, and they filmed the scene to show you why. They didn't even want these people playing their music on their street. They got arrested for playing music. They didn't like it. It wasn't Bruce Springsteen. If they had gone down the street <laughs> playing Bruce. In New Jersey, you're, you're fine. You play Bruce, you're, you're good. Oh, my gosh. Uh, have, you ever, have you ever been offered a bribe? No, never. Bruce Springsteen tickets? Nothing? Nope. Nope. Oh, man. <laughs> I had an experience here where somebody thought I was soliciting a bribe. What does that mean? Oh, you're asking for a bribe? Yeah, well, it, it, it's funny. Like, I guess, you know, I work in um, an industry where you get a lot of people coming from out of town. I mean, that's Vegas is driven by travelers. <laughs> you're a pimp. Um, so I was explaining a fee to somebody, and the way I worded it, he kind of got like an old Las Vegas vibe where he thought like this was the payoff he had to give me in order for this thing to happen. And it was pretty funny um, oh, when I realized that the way I worded it made the guy think I was soliciting a payoff. It was wow. pretty funny. That's beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, we got Red Tyler here. Uh, yeah, Red, Red, Red Tyler wants, just pooped, apparently. He wants us to shout out his girlfriend, Kim Dougal. Hey, Kim. Is that a joke? <laughs> <laughs> I'm rolling with it. Hey, well, Red, thanks for... Red, <laughs> he pooped. Just now. <laughs> That's what I mean. He just told us that he just pooped. Yeah, he said I just. He goes, I pooped just now. LOL. Uh, is he laughing at the funny poop, or <laughs> it's funny that he went poop? I'm not sure. <laughs> well, he's he's getting more airtime than uh, anybody else, so. Uh, well, well, Red, uh, welcome to the show. Uh, I'm glad that we make you regular. I hope you'll continue to be a regular <laughs> listener. <laughs> All right, let's talk about. Um, we talked about the go to lunch scene already. Uh, go to lunch. If there's a pretty interesting scene here too, where Heflin says to Ray, uh, "Yeah, Ray and sorry, I keep seeing Ray Liotta, um, Figus yeah. and, and yeah, Figus and uh, Heflin. They're like living together now because his house burnt down, and mm -hmm. Figus is hanging out at uh, at uh, Sheriff Heflin's house." 
And he, uh, Sheriff Heflin says, you know, if I saw her today in the river again, drowning, I wouldn't go get her. I wouldn't. I'm not a hero anymore. It's basically what he's saying. Bullshit. Hmm. I, I I didn't take it to mean that, Ryan. And maybe it's because of my, uh, you know, my sort of take on her as a character is. It felt to me like he he's been used, and I think he sort of resented the fact that he was where he was, but that he was also not really a, a driver and more of somebody that was being sort of abused and, uh, and held down. Um, I, I, I really dig the fact that we have such different uh, interpretations of that, of that scene. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think he kind of meant it. I think he's just saying that he's a coward now. He's not, he's not who he, he isn't who he thought he was anymore. Like he maybe he isn't maybe that moment he feels like, uh, He's just not the hero that everyone thinks he should be. Uh, well, sorry, I mean, that that sorry. does sort of speak to what he ends up doing in the movie. So right. it does add some credence to that. Absolutely. What does Doug think? Well, uh, Red Tyler's girlfriend thinks uh, Doug is good looking. That's what the big deal is here. No, that's good. Uh, <laughs> he, you know, he says he went to high school think, with one of you. He says he went to high school with one of us. It must be you. Is Red, is Red Tyler a troll? No, he says... Uh, he says, my girlfriend says she loves the Dougal. Was your nickname <laughs> Dougal? No. <laughs> <laughs> and he's he's being a little cryptic. I think that's Dave Mustang on his <laughs> face pic his picture profile and there. He's about to do the thing. So. <laughs> he's about to do so they're 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 watching our episode, but they're about to make love to each other, I guess, during oh. their <laughs> that's fine. Hey, whatever we do to help you guys out, we're here for you guys. Um <laughs> uh, anyways, uh, uh Oh, did you notice Method, say, Method Method Man was in this movie? Did you guys catch that? Yeah, he's the one that yeah. that um throws uh Peter Berger off Where the roof, right? What yeah. a funny cast! Yeah. This is a crazy cast. I mean, you got Method Man, you got the guy from King of Queens, the black actor from King of Queens. You've got uh, Peter Berg, who's actually a very established director. I mean, he gives James Mangold a run for his money when it comes to movies nowadays. Lone Survivor was directed by Peter Berg. He also did Battleship, which is a badass movie and I'll fight anybody who says it isn't. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll commit. I never, <laughs> uh, never that's Doug's Battleship. big confession. He's never seen oh, battleship. Yeah. Well, I mean, Battlefield and raging. Bull. The one. <laughs> yeah. Battleship was, uh, you know, uh, somebody, yeah. we keep referencing Robert De Niro, but we, I don't think we've ever explained what his role in this movie is. Who's that? To anybody who doesn't already know, Robert De Niro. Well, he's oh. he's a he's a the cop of cops, right? He's IAD. He's the internal affairs, the internal affairs uh, investigator. Uh, he's as uh, the rest of the cops call him a rat because internal affairs cops all they do is fuck other cops. Okay, you're a cop, right, Doug? Have we established this yet throughout this episode? <laughs> I think so. I think it's been well established. What is the official word on the street when it comes to IA? Because they play this in movies all the time that IA and then and then Harvey Keitel's character says, you know, you know how they become IA? They were caught doing something bad and then they, they're, they're now IA. Is there any truth to IA and do cops truly hate them? Go. No. The, the only cops that have anything against IA are the cops that are doing something wrong in the first place. So Which how do you feel about happens. IA? I don't care about IA because they don't investigate me because <laughs> I told the line. I do what I'm there, supposed to do. There you go. I do all the guys that I know. Like that it's like the whole IA thing is just built up in movies. It's not oh, real. It's not real. The hatred is it, yeah, it, it's not real. I appreciate you answering that because I think uh, our listeners want to know that. They want to know the truth. I don't think they do. <laughs> <laughs> they're they're they do right now. They don't want to know from me. Of course they do. I think Red Tyler is drunk. We're gonna ignore him. We love you, brother, but I don't know what the heck you're talking about. He, oh, he he just says he does acid. He he wants you to come arrest him. I do acid, cop. What do you think about that? You know, um... Red Tyler. Oh. <laughs> Duck's right. going. He's going. He's leaving. He's he's found his address. He's googled this guy. He's off to get him. Oh, well, you got bugs well, I'm, on I'm you. I'm off duty. Yeah, you see that a mosquito flying around. Yeah, Red oh, Tyler. <laughs> Red Tyler. You know who he is? Do you know who he is? <laughs> no idea, but no I love idea. the guy. Uh, <laughs> he went to third grade with one of us, though. He went to third period with one of us. I don't know. Third Anyways. <laughs> hey, hey, Red Tyler, do you, you have anything you want us to plug? 
I just thought about three different jokes and I can't say them. Okay. Um, all right, here we go. Where are you go? When, uh, uh, <coughs> so, so Stallone goes to, or Freddie goes to see once, once he decides that, all right, this, this, uh, yeah, this shit is the big scene smell right here in, in Copland. But for, yeah. before the big scene, he, go, oh, okay. he goes back to New York to talk to Mo Tilden, who's Robert De Niro's character, right? Would give yeah. him a chance to be a cop. Yeah, when yeah. right, he um uh Freddie already admitted that he was blind to what was going on. So he goes to New York to see Mo Tilden and he's like, All right, I'm ready to do this. And <laughs> and Robert De Niro slash Mo Tilden ain't having it. He's like, well, well, case is closed. What do you want me to do? He's like, I, you know, I want my, you to my, do the right thing. My hands are tied. My hands are tied, you know. He's got you he, he that sandwich. This. My hands are tied. <laughs> well, why doesn't the sandwich place ever give them napkins? Come on. <laughs> He goes, he uh, Kleenex about... box. Have you ever used Kleenex as a napkin? It does it's, make for a terrible napkin. It's the worst. <laughs> but Freddie goes, What about Babbage? He goes, What about him? Fuck him. What about <laughs> Babbage? <laughs> Fuck him too. <laughs> All right, here we go. Here we go. Ready? You offered you a chance when we could have done something. I offered you a chance to be a cop, and you blew it. <laughs> 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 I love it. <laughs> the, the the great the great thing about that scene is you see the gears going in 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 De Niro's head, realizing that this is an opportunity to get traction going for his case again, and he knows mm -hmm. that he's going to be able to use Freddie like everybody else has used Freddie, which makes Freddie even more of a like a tragic character. Yeah, he, I mean, it, it's a risky game, though, because, like, he's saying, you know, I gave it a chance, you blew it, it's over, it's over. So Freddie can very well just walk out of the office, and, and that's that. But he's he's gambling on Freddie doing the right thing. And, um, I mean, you know, God bless all of us. Our pal Stallone <laughs> steps up. Well, what's the, what's the line when he leaves? He says, if that cupcake makes a mess... We've got yeah, a we got a again. case again. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that was what it was. Okay, here's my little uh, story. So I, I, uh, I went to go on my on-demand cable server to to get on-demand Copland. It didn't have it on on demand. I'm like, you got to be kidding me! Like I was going to pay five bucks get it on. Even the specialist was available on on demand. Then I went to Amazon. Amazon didn't have it for rent in Canada. And oh, then uh, and then so I said, okay, fine. I'll just uh, buy the DVD. Because I'm like, if I spend five bucks, they're selling the DVD for eight bucks Blu-ray in Canada, eight dollars Canadian, so that's like six dollars US. So I'm like, well, sure, why not? Why don't I just, I'll own it. And it got here Wednesday. Now my house, I've got a lot of kids in my house, and I often watch movies with captions, so I don't have to have it very loud, so I can do, I just watch it with captions. I got the one movie in Blu-ray history that has zero features it doesn't even have a menu you put the blu-ray in and it just, it just starts, starts playing plays. there's no menu no captions nothing so if you were a deaf person and bought this blu-ray you'd be like poop out of luck so anyways long story short there was there was times during this movie because i couldn't have it too loud because i had kids running around i was like what did he say there because i'm relying on what they're saying and that was actually one of the things was i was like what did he say when he left there i knew he was referring to if he stirs up trouble we'll get something out of this guy but he said cupcake all right Anyways, it's frustrating. Oh, yeah. <laughs> wow, that was a long walk for that one. Well, it's part of my story that I, I, you know, I don't pirate things. You know, I don't like to pirate things. I like to buy it, and I, I'm surprised I don't own this yet. Anyways, so long story short, I'm able to order it from the U.S. I'm getting the director's cut Blu-ray. It's going to be here later, but too late now. Anyways, I'll own it though, but I'll I'll own the director's cut shortly. <clears throat> on you doug the camera's on you i'm just gonna point to who's next you go all right well um so freddie goes back and he ends up finding murray he digs a little bit and he finds murray babbage hiding after they try to kill him after uh ray and his boys try to kill him uh he finds murray hiding hiding out in the water tower right well good thing they had that above ground pool that they could have attempted to drown him <laughs> in because they would have had to get him into a bathroom, into a bathtub instead, right? Why was it so hard to kill him? Why did they just like why? Well, drown no, he him? needed he needed to have water in his lungs, right? Oh, mm -hmm. 
to See, do they, supposedly they, drown. Yeah. They didn't spell it out for me. So I needed another synopsis. <laughs> we got to drown him in the pool because he has to have blood in his, you know, uh, water in his lungs. That's what I needed. Yeah, chlorinated water, which I don't know. <laughs> it was rain. It was rain water. <laughs> okay, so he slips. He slips. Uh, he slips the jab. Runs away. And uh, let's get to the final. Let's get to the final gunfight here. Let's just get to the the bee's knees of this last scene. Well, even, even, okay, so so the bee's knees starts with Freddie going back to the bar and right. telling Ray. He goes, "I got Superboy. I'm yeah. going to turn him in tomorrow." And he's like, "Why don't you do the right thing? Come with me. We'll all go together. <laughs> Kumbaya. You know, you'll, you'll you'll cop to your shit, and Murray will cop to his, and everything will be fine, right? Right. And then." Uh, <laughs> Ray gives this this beautiful, this Harvey Keitel speech. About, and he's great in this film too, by the way. Your plan is the plan of a boy. <laughs> you made it on the back of a matchbook without thinking, <laughs> without looking at the cards. <laughs> in other words, don't shut me out, Heflin. Yeah. Oh, oh man. So all, you know, Ray's not going. He's like, sure, sure. Yeah. Six o'clock tomorrow. I'll be there. But what happens is Freddie gets ambushed. They take Superboy. They blow out Freddie's good ear. So we hear that like it's like the constant feedback now. Bleeding, he's, yeah, he's 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 bleeding through from his ear like everything else for the rest of the movie. Everything's in slow motion. The shootout. Yeah, it's a very effective scene because we're feeling stressed out as a viewer for his safety. We're we're feeling the, the danger that it's around the corner for him. Uh, you know, he can't hear anything. He doesn't know where guys are, if they're alive or dead, if they're moving around. And then uh, he shoots He shoots uh, the one guy in the car, and then he uh, shoots uh, the T-1000 after that. Yeah. And then... Uh, <laughs> he's got the, he's got the best, best death scene in the movie, right? Yeah. The look on his face when he gets shot and falls back is like, he's he can't believe that Freddie Heflin's the guy that took his life. That's awesome. And... Uh, and then uh, we, Heflin's about to get shot by another guy, and uh, Ray Liotta comes out of nowhere. Yeah, the biggest hero moment. Well, he does get shot by that guy. He gets <laughs> shot like in the back of his shoulder. Yeah, and then he's ready, like uh, he's ready to, to finish him off. And then yeah, the hero Ray Liotta comes out of nowhere and blows him away. I love how he's got a smoke in his mouth. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he um, right after he kills that guy, he sees. He sees Ray in like the picture window of his house. Yeah, and he like he like gives him the death stare before he brings his gun on. <laughs> yeah, blows out great, the front window. Great stuff. So that window just goes. Um, then Ray goes up there to, uh, to 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 finish him off, and it's always a weird scene. It must be what first thing in the morning because that uh, his wife's still lying in bed. Yeah, and, uh, Superboy's about to jump out another window. Boy, he what, jumps off bridges, jumps out of houses. What's yeah, yeah, yeah. He's <laughs> well, he. Th I mean. You know, it's it's either die by Ray's hand or die by jumping out of a second floor window. And he was handcuffed too, wasn't he? I don't think at that point. No, he, um, was. he he had a handcuff on. He must have been sleeping with his wife too. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> that was maybe, maybe 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 Harvey Keitel Ray uh, Ray uh, well, maybe he was a cuckold. <laughs> uh. <laughs> He liked to watch all of his cop friends make love to his wife. That's the whole story. He came. He came. <laughs> maybe that's what. Maybe that's what uh, De Niro was saying. You blew it. She blew it. <laughs> oh my goodness! You know what I love about about this though? When um, Ray comes, he sneaks in behind Freddie, and then Figs shoots at Ray. Which, like, just that little, <laughs> Craig, you're right over there. <laughs> <laughs> just oh, uh, he, called like the, muff, the, the muff. <laughs> <laughs> That's what the thing is. They're all cuckolders. <laughs> <clears throat> and he and Heflin was never invited <laughs> to the party. He never got to put his keys in the bowl. <laughs> no, because he doesn't have a partner to swap. <laughs> That's right. Uh, okay, all right. And see, that's true. So once Ray, Ray Liotta's girl died, he had to leave town because he had no one to swap with. Oh, there you go. Yep. Oh, 200. 
All right. Well, we've uh, reached the what, end of our. So, other, oh, go ahead. <laughs> no, I, I just wanted to finish up. Like when uh, like so so Ray ends up shooting. No, not Ray. Freddie ends up shooting Ray, right. and Ray as he as he falls, he he's dying on top of his NYPD uniform. Did you notice uh, that? Ah, very poetic. Right on top of it, you see the the NYPD patch right by his head. And he's saying a lot of stuff that probably isn't appropriate for this podcast because. Right. Um, if you can read lips, uh, he's saying much profanity, right? He's actually saying, uh, he's saying, uh, 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 Fred, you were next. You were next in line with my wife. You just had to wait. <laughs> <laughs> and then Freddie's got that great line where he says, I can't hear you, Ray. Uh, Love that line. Love that oh, line. That's, yeah, that's great. Uh, and then, of course, he brings him in, Ray Liotta, looking just looking horrible. Like uh, Sloan's character is covered in blood. And he still looks better than Ray Liotta. <laughs> Ray Liotta just looks... Te- he looks horrible in this movie. And I don't know. Was it did, was it the makeup people applying makeup or not giving him any makeup? I'm, I, I, I think Liotta himself was on a three-day coke bender. I know. Throughout, throughout the whole filming. It's seven years after Goodfellas. He hasn't recovered from his method acting. Yeah. If, if, you, ha- <laughs> if, if you haven't listened to it yet, he was on... Uh, Mark Maron's podcast uh, within the last couple months and uh, great episode. Uh, okay. A lot of insight into uh, into Ray Liotta and what and what made him the uh, the actor he is today. Cool. In fact, speaking of Michael Rappaport, he has a podcast and uh, Robert Patrick was on it recently as well. And I couldn't find him. I'm going to look for it again. And they talk specifically about Copland throughout that episode. So all of our five listeners, when you're done with this one, go find that one. You'll probably it'll probably be better. But watch ours first because you know Michael's a professional. We're just ham and eggers. So, uh, what do you guys give this uh, movie? Do you do you out of ten, out of five? How do you want to do this? I want to give it stars. I don't know. Like, how do you rate this in the canon of uh, slow films? Oh. <laughs> I I think it's hey, one of his uh, best. Okay, take away Rocky and Rambo. Is there a better film that he's done? I would say no. I love this film. There are certain people really that might argue Nighthawks could give this movie a run for its money in terms of what Sly delivers, but I, I think if you take Rocky and Rambo out of the equation, um, it's really hard not to have Copland sit right at the top. And then right underneath it, Ants and Spy Kids 3D game over. That's what about funny. what about Ratchet and Clank? Where do you... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's yeah. it's tough. It's top three. I, I I don't know which order I put them in right now. Um, but uh, like non Rocky Rambo, you're looking at um, top three for me are like not in this order, but Cliffhanger, Lock Up, and Copland. Those are movies that are, where you're just like, and I really want to talk about Lock Up. I don't know which one we're gonna talk about next, but uh, maybe I'll throw Lock Up in the mix for my vote. For uh, oh, we'll have the, we'll have the audience. Pull, uh, I knew Copland was gonna win, but for the record, how dare you? Who who was it that put in Copland again? Mr. Doug. Okay, Doug, <laughs> I put in, what did I put in? Assassins. Uh, you put in Get Carter oh, there, Craig. It, like the, That was the vein I was going for. Doug's like, well, I'm going to put in his best movie ever. Well, of course people are going to vote for that. <laughs> well, we, we, you didn't put any parameters on it. We can't do Lock Up next because we can't do two Stallone movies that take place in New Jersey back to back. Oh, okay. That's true. I'll, I'll think of another one. I might put assassins back in the mix. Maybe for our tens and tens of listeners, let's uh let's get assassins going. But uh, yeah, we'll, that'll be there. fun. Um, so let uh, let's just close up the show. Uh, I'll just remind everyone I'm Ryan, and uh, if you want to listen to me on my other podcast, it's all about uh, the Rocky series. It's called Going the Distance, the Rocky series podcast. Um, if you want to listen to me there, check check me out and i do that with my brother and I, and I doug and uh craig uh have been on it uh, craig have yeah you, you've been on it so i always love these guys and uh the reason why we're doing this is because i think we just like each other i think we get along on the podcast world and i think it's fun just to connect in a way that uh doesn't step on each other's toes really and we can still just you know what you can never talk about any movie more than too much is what i mean it's like the, uh we could talk about copland or lock up on our other shows as well you can never talk about it too much uh, Doug, why don't you tell the audience who you are? I'm Doug. Uh, I'm a co-host of Rocky Minute. We're um, similar to Ryan, but we 
take a different approach. We break down the Rocky minutes, one minute of movie time at a time uh, for each episode. So, uh, I mean, the first our first season where we covered the movie Rocky was 118 individual episodes. So uh, awesome. Uh, we're gearing to start Rocky, too. So um, DuelingGenre.com is where we uh, release our episodes there. Right on. And I'm Craig from the Slycast, and uh, we may not put out episodes with as much frequency as as Ryan and, and Doug. They're um, just better. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, there is, uh, what, I think 25 episodes now, including uh, our crossover episode, with, which was the first episode of this podcast where we cover the specialist. But uh, Slycast, we examined Sil- Sylvester Stallone's career um, from his very early days in sequential order up until... Um, you know, his present day work and uh, our next episode, whenever that is, we'll be covering the classic Judge Dredd. Hey. Oh, Judge Dredd. Yeah, boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan's excited. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, yeah. Well, I'd love to I'd love to hear your discussion on that. Maybe down the road when enough time has passed, we can cover that as a trio ourselves because that'd be a fun one to talk with you guys as well. It, it, uh, fun's one word. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks, guys. As always, it's, it's an awesome pleasure to uh, to talk with you guys, and I hope our listeners enjoy it as much as we did doing it. And I want to apologize for the confusion. Next time we do this in October, we're trying to do this once a month. Uh, I will make sure that it goes through the proper Sylvester Stallone podcast network. I should have said that for our listeners. Uh, the channel on YouTube is called the Sylvester Stallone Podcast Network. It's pretty cool. If you actually just punch in Stallone Podcast, we're like third already down the list. So it works out really nicely. Um, so come like us on there. So subscribe there. Like us on there. Yeah. That way you can you will never miss uh, once, a once a month episode regarding this trio of us. And and actually, little do you know that um, for the past hour and 45 minutes, people have been staring at that screen waiting for us to go live. I Thousands know. Thousands of people. Thousands. <laughs> Thousands. Yeah, I, I didn't verify the account on time. It's a new account, and I panicked. So that's why we're going through this channel. But it'll, it'll be all ready to go next time. All right, guys. Well, you know what, Ryan? Also, we just hit the hour 45-minute mark. So if somebody's going to listen back to this, they can watch along to Copland and have mm-hmm. us talk about things completely unrelated to what they're seeing on the screen. But it <laughs> right. would still be fun. And the movie would be over when we're done. That's awesome. Live commentary. Awesome. (laughs) Love it. You blew it.